Uh, yeah, I'm grateful for, for the opportunity just to be a part of this project. The last year and a half or two years has just been uh, a great experience. And, and just like Dr. Morgan mentioned, I'll be talking about soil and the interaction between soil and water and specifically the effects that soil health practices have on soil water characteristics. And, I, and before I start advancing into my slides, I think it's important to recognize that um, 70, you know, arguably 70% of the fresh water that's consumed globally every year is, is consumed through agriculture. And so any way that we can uh, become more efficient in agriculture with our water is, is an important uh, topic to explore or important way to, to research. So one of the things that really regulates the interaction between soil and water uh, in the soil is uh, soil structure. There we go. Sorry. So these are you actually saw these pictures a little bit before, at least the one on the left in Dr. Groove, and she did a uh, in her presentation. She did a fantastic job with aggregate stability, and this is uh, uh, related to her talk as well. Uh, but you can see in these two pictures, uh, this soil has has decent soil structure. You can see aggregates. Uh, you can see channels or highways for water not only to infiltrate but roots to, to grow through. Not only is the water allowed to infiltrate but it's allowed to store and be made available to the, to the crop. And so this is really kind of what we're shooting for in an agricultural system is, is something with this kind of structure. And in, agriculture produ in agricultural production there's really two main things that affect soil structure. Um, there may be a few others, but in general, there's two, two main categories. The first one is soil forming factors. So how, how did the soil form and gain its structure naturally? And some of the things we look at uh, is the climate, the organisms or the biota, the topography or, or landscape position and, and slopes and relief, uh, the parent material, or in other words, uh, uh, clay, percent sand, silt, and clay, or the texture of the soil, and then time. How long has that soil been in place without being interrupted? And then the other main category are the management practices. And so arguably, this is another soil forming factor, an, anthro an anthropic or a human soil forming factor. Uh, and so specifically, when, when we talk about management practices, I'm going to focus on tillage, cover crops, uh, nutrient type for my presentation, but there are additional ones like crop rotation, uh, uh, and, and diversity and things like that. And one example of a negative impact of management uh, is through intense tillage. And these two pictures here are examples of systems that were uh, tilled. The one on the right is a moldboard plow, and I think the one on the left is the same. And you can see that that aggregate stability, that structure of the soil has been destroyed. And I was, I was taught in my, uh, my soil genesis class that if you think about uh, city that's been really well organized, has lots of structures, um, roadways, highways, driveways, all these different, um, I guess, routes for water to go. When you till it, you destroy that infrastructure. You destroy that city, so to speak, and it just becomes these big clods, and it makes it harder or more tortuous for the water to get through. And so what happens is, and again, Dr. Grubel uh, gave a good picture of this, you get these, these surface crusts or even sometimes you get erosion, and these are two fields, both corn and soybean fields, that are tilled, and not even, not even in my opinion, intensely tilled, but um, you know, disc maybe, maybe once in the spring or once in the fall. But yet, it, it disturbs and wrecks that soil structure and makes it susceptible to erosion, both both wind and water erosion. And so you can see the the real or goalie erosion on the left in that picture, and then the picture on the right, you can see the water moving off the field, and this is after uh, planting even. So the, the field was tilled and planted and then we had this this rain event and the water is moving off the field and, field and carrying the soil with it. You can also see if I use my pointer here, these little plants emerging from the soil, that's the corn that was planted. And so you're losing not only your soil but your yield, your plant. So it's an environmental loss and a, and a financial loss as well. And so it's important to really consider how management is affecting the soil, the soil structure and ultimately the interaction between soil and water. And there's several different ways that we can measure that interaction between soil and water. So one of those measurements is available water holding capacity or how much water is the soil holding that's also available for plant uptake. 
Um, this is an important one. It's also um, a lot of times related to drought resiliency. Another one is bulk density. It's, it's an indirect measure of soil structure. It can also be related to other things like soil compaction and, and whatnot. But for my purposes today, I'll, I'll be referring to bulk density as an indirect measure of soil structure. And generally with bulk density, the lower bulk density you have, the better your soil structure is most likely to be. Uh, and I can explain a little bit more of that in the slides to come. And then there's saturated hydraulic conductivity or the speed of the water as it's moving through the soil profile. And this is a saturated measurement. So it's, uh, if, you, if you picture a, an agricultural field in the spring when it's at field capacity, how fast when the soil is at that capacity is that, is that water draining through the soil profile. And then that's really, that's really where this, this uh, project, the NAPESHIM or North American Project to Evaluate Soil Measurements comes in. Uh, growing up, I used to read these truck magazines and they would do all these comparisons with uh, these truck manufacturers to determine which, which truck was best. And, and in, in this case, this project allowed us to do a comparison of these measurements to determine which one was most sensitive, or perhaps we could say best. Um, and, and being sensitive to management decisions or management practices. And, and because of this project, we had the same, same measurements, same method on paired treatments and on these long-term sites that were generally greater than eight years, established for at least eight years. Uh, and so it, it's a, just a unique opportunity to really do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of these measurements and methods. So you can see a picture there. Dr. Morgan showed this picture earlier of all the, the partnering scientists, well, at least some of them. Uh, you know, this was during the shut the government shutdown, so a lot of our government uh, partners aren't aren't in the photo. But I just I'll give a thanks to them again at the end. But just without without these folks, the project wouldn't have been possible. So and this really leads to kind of my slice of the pie for the project. Uh, my first objective was to to determine which tier one soil water measurement is most sensitive to changes in management. And again, when we say tier one, which Tier one measurements are those that are accepted and kind of known to be uh, reliable or, or sensitive. And so I want to know which one, uh, which which one was most sensitive. So the first one is available water link capacity. Uh, and there is two two methods in which this was measured. So the first one was intact, uh, where you keep the structure of the soil intact, like the name implies, and then put it on an apparatus and it measures the, the available water link capacity. The next one was repacked soil where the soil gets processed or sieved and that soil structure is really kind of eliminated from the process then it gets put on an apparatus and tested for available water holding capacity so i'll be looking at a comparison of those methods as well and then the other one was the bulk density using the core method which is a traditional method you pound a, a core of a known volume of the soil you dig or, you dig that that core out you level off the top and the bottom uh, to get a known or to to make sure that nothing's going out of that that volume that known volume and then you, you dry it you weigh it um, or you, you weigh it dry it, and then you can get a mass over volume uh, measurement and then the last one is KSAT or that saturated hydraulic conductivity and you can see the picture of the method we use it's it's an infield or an in situ method where it's actually saturating the soil profile you can see the water jug there and then it's applying different pressures onto that soil uh, and measuring uh, the flow as the, as the water goes through the soil profile. So that was the first objective. The second one was can soil health management management practices improve soil water cycling? And like I mentioned before, I'll focus on reduced or no, or just tillage intensity in general, uh, cover crops and nutrient type or inorganic versus organic. So the results, uh, Diving into it, we'll talk about bulk density first. So this is the distribution of bulk density across this, uh, uh, the sites that we sampled. You can see if I use my pointer here that bulk density is on the X, and then you have the frequency or the number of, of plots that we sampled that had that same bulk density. So the average bulk density that we saw was about 1.23 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, and so how well did this measurement respond to tillage? So this is, a, again, a response plot. We're on the X, you can see the change in bulk density. Uh, and then over on the Y, you have the different tillage comparisons. So overall, which is an average of, of these different uh, pairs or comparisons. And then you have the different intensity levels here with moderate and intense, minimum versus moderate, and the minimum versus intense. And you can see, because none of these these whiskers, so to speak, or these ranges are touching this zero line, we did get a significant response 
uh, with bulk density when comparing it to tillage. So not only that, but we got a negative response and our bulk density value is decreasing with decreasing tillage, which is good. That's saying that um, perhaps our structure is getting better as we, as we decrease the amount that we're tilling in the soil. So this means if we take our average bulk density of 1.23, and if we were to apply soil health management practices to those fields, our bulk density would go down from 1.23 to 1.19. So, and then if we compare it to the other management practices I'm focusing on for cover crops, we really didn't see uh, any significant change or sensitivity uh, with bulk density or organic amendment. So tillage, bulk density was really the sensitive to, to the tillage practice. So and then diving into hydraulic conductivity, uh, very log normally distributed. Uh, you can see that our range, I'll put the range up here, was anywhere from 0.1 centimeters per hour 108 centimeters per hour. And this picture, I think, really helps describe maybe why we saw that range. And so you can see our plots were fairly big. This is actually a plot in North Carolina on one of Dr. Groove's sites. Uh, and and if, with, with saturated hydraulic conductivity, you can move over a foot and take a measurement here, and you may get a different value. And so it's just by the nature of the measurement, extremely variable. Um, but nonetheless, how, how well did it? Uh, how, how sensitive was it to management? So again, this is tillage. You can see that uh, for overall, we really didn't see a significant response using this, this measurement, except for the comparison between minimum and intense tillage. So basically what we're saying is if you were to switch, say from a moldboard plow to a, to a no-till management system, you would see a significant change in your saturated hydraulic conductivity or the speed at which that soil is flowing through the soil. With the speed at which the water is flowing through the soil profile. So if we were to compare it to the other uh, management practices, it really wasn't sensitive to cover crops or adding organic amendment. So we really want to focus on this, the significant response we saw to the, the comparison between minimum and intense tillage. So we saw about a, an increase of, of 7% in the speed of the water as it moves through the, the saturated soil profile. And then if we were to uh, change that into, uh, you know, our average, if we were to in, in, uh, apply soil health management practices on our average KSAT, we would jump up to 18.2 centimeters per hour, which is an additional half an inch per hour. So if you have in the spring, you have a saturated soil profile and you have a rainfall event, as long as it doesn't exceed that rate of half an inch per hour, you wouldn't, theoretically, you wouldn't get any ponding on the soil surfaces. So I'll just go ahead and end with the available water holding capacity test. So again, there's two methods in which this was measured. And you can see the distribution was, was fairly normal for each, but with the intact core, so when you, when you preserve the structure of the soil, you're getting an average AWC of about uh, 0.18. So if you're to, uh, and that's cubic meters of water per cubic meter of soil. So if you were to multiply this value by 100, you would get the percent of this cubic meter of soil that could have available water to the plant. And so using this method, that's about 18% available water holding capacity. Using this method, it's more like 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.23 or 0.25%. So with this repack method where you're destroying the soil structure, it's telling us that we're having more available water holding capacity. So how well did these methods respond to management? Well, uh, very, very differently, actually. So with the intact core, you can see that we got a response uh, in every category except minimum versus moderate. And with the repacks, there really wasn't any significant response except for this one method. So this is telling us that the intact core method really is the method to go with when measuring available water holding capacity. It's more sensitive to management change. So just kind of uh, to, to give you a visual of this, this is a site in Kentucky. And on the left, we have a no-till uh, practice, management practice. On the right, we have a till practice. And you can see this visual stair step down between these two practices. And this, is, this was a, this study was, was established in the 1970s. So it's been in these practices for a long time. So if we were to say that this water bottle represents the till capacity of that treatment to hold plant available water, we're saying if you switch to no-till, 
your available water holding capacity grows or increases, and which could be which could make or break you in a dry year. Uh, if you convert this to gallons, this is an additional 200 or 2,200 gallons per acre in the top six inches of soil. Uh, and now, if you were to look at this in inches of rain that it could that it could take in, in addition, it's about 0.15 inches in the top six inches of the soil that it could take in additional precipitation. So, and I will point out that interestingly, if we consider the other management practices, cover crops, we had a similar response to with cover crops as we did with, did with reducing our tillage. So in conclusion, uh, you know, if I had to rank these third, second, first place of which measurement I would use as a, as a producer, as a research scientist, in third place would be bulk density. It's it's cheap, it is sensitive to tillage. You do need it to calculate soil carbon stock, but it's not a direct measure of soil function. In second place, KSAT, it's a great measurement. I think it has a lot of potential, especially if you have time to do multiple measurements per plot. Um, it does have high variability, but it is a direct measure of soil function. And then, of course, finally, the, the king or the, the winner, queen, I guess, king or queen, uh, of, of these measurements is the available water holding capacity and it's the intact core method. Uh, and not only is it a direct measure of soil function, but uh, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Diana Bagnell is gonna talk about how we can estimate available water holding capacity through modeling. And so perhaps we can get that cost down. With that, uh, I'd just like to thank our partnering scientists and then of course the financial support that we received from, uh, from the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, General Mills, and the Foundation for Food and Agriculture.